Hey, welcome to the catacombs, my 10 room mansion. This is the cabinet of curiosities. My African collections. The bull from Pamplona. I even have an outhouse here. Someone was selling an old barn. I bought the lumber. And this is my kitchen here. You see why I don't have dinner parties. My friends want to know why I don't invite them for dinner. I hope they all see this. <laughs> then, this is my dining room over here. Table found in the garbage on Broom Street. Try and find something like that in the garbage now. This is my bedroom, living room, everything room. These are my collections here. That's my clothing closet. And these are my clothes, <laughs> pretty much. This is my guest room. And it actually goes back like a first class chair on an airplane. And then this is my studio. And I spend all my time here, really, day and night. As a kid, every Sunday, my mother would give me a dollar. And I would go with my brother to the Museum of Natural History and go to the room where the mummies were. And I never thought I'd have my own mummies. But I never forgot those rooms and also the glass cases with the landscapes and the animals. I loved it. I always wanted to live in one of those cases. So it's kind of a creation of what I did when I was a kid, going to the museum. People are afraid to come here. I actually have people who get nervous here. And a lot, they don't want to sleep here, that's for sure. If they do, they're my friends forever. <laughs> but all of these things are very, they have good karma. Even the voodoo stuff, it's, you know, voodoo's not all bad. A lot of that voodoo stuff is to make you better. Yeah, how about a tarantula? I like to use materials that you wouldn't consider art materials. I like things that are taboo. I like to work with people's cremation ashes. I work with blood. And it's not so much to shock other people. I kind of like to shock myself. But my whole life is about walking on the edge. It's not just my art. Everything I do is... Uh... <laughs> A friend of mine was crossing the Williamsburg Bridge, and he called me up and he said, I found a toe. Do you want it? It was mummified. It had no smell. Anyway, he came over for dinner that night, and he brought this toe. It took me the longest time to touch that toe, and I glued it to a piece of paper, and I started collecting things about feet. So I had a thread from Baryshnikov's ballet slipper, Isabella Rosalini's pantyhose, James Cagney's shoe, all this stuff about feet. And then I start doing other museums. I went to Pratt and I studied painting. And then when I first got out of school, I took a job at Bloomingdale's. That was the last job I had. That was 1968. And I've lived off my art since. And then I went to Africa in 1970. I fell in love with African art, African masks, and I couldn't paint anymore, and I came back and I started making objects, fetish-type things, and so I guess I can say I never painted after Africa. Everything that was around, they made art with. Whatever you threw away was always picked up and turned into art. It was great. I would see all these pieces made out of the cowrie shells, and when I came back, I started making things with shells.
Barton's a very unusual, even eccentric artist. He's not making abstract paintings, he's not making figurative paintings, he's not making minimalist sculpture. He really seems to have evolved his own particular individualistic, odd way of making art. These are my Anne Evelyn's letters. This is all our correspondence for seven years. I got my first grant from doing her letters. She wrote me 50 typewritten, single-spaced, double-sided letters two to three times a week. And then one day she said, are you gay? And I said, oh, Jesus. So I said, yeah, and that started the whole thing, and we had this incredible correspondence. She would talk about outrageous things. I mean, I mean, you name it. If it was typed on pink, it was meant to be very personal. <laughs> so the pink pages were not to be read by anybody but me. These letters kept coming, and I didn't know what to do with them, and they were taking up my whole life. So I got huge canvases, and as I read the letters, I would stamp them out. Then I start making them into books. And I made 600 books of her letters. This is a letter she wrote about dried up typewriter ribbons. So I printed the whole letter on a typewriter ribbon. Everyone likes me on the telephone. I get lots of compliments. The man from the typewriter company, who I complained to about those dried up ribbons, said, I bet you can do lots of things. I don't know what the man had in mind that he felt I could do. He is definitely interested in me personally, especially the way he is trying so hard to please me, which is fine over the phone. But he is picturing me much different than I am, so I don't ever want him to see me. <laughs> Usually, the letter's printed on the object. Like, she talks about cleaning house, so I printed her letters about house cleaning on scrub brushes. Well, she found out what I was doing, that I was making art out of her books, and she freaked out. She stopped writing to me. And then it was time, anyhow, you know. I always find when I do something a long time, and everyone likes it, it's time to move on. I guess that art museum started. I originally had a Picasso, an original Picasso, and I, um, I got high one night. And I went up to my Picasso and I did some graffiti on it, thinking I was being real clever. And then in the morning I was sobered up and I thought, oh my God, what did I do to my Picasso? So I thought, let me see how I can salvage this. And I put it in the blender and chopped the whole Picasso up and put it in little bottles and sold Picasso by the gram. So I start collecting different things from artists. I got Mark Rothko's tie with paint on it. And a piece of a Julian Schnabel that fell off at the Houston Museum, off one of the paintings. Susan Weil, who used to be married to Rauschenberg, was going to visit him in Captiva and I says, get me get me something from, I need a wet, oh, crayon from a studio. And she says they spent the whole day, they finally found three small crayons, can you imagine? People do bring you things. Most of my stuff here is actually made from stuff that people have given me. Hey. How you doing? Uh, I can't stay, but I came across something and I thought you might like them. What's in here? Oh my god, what is this? The thing has to have a story. I don't care if it's a celebrity. I prefer interesting stories. Oh my god. He found this 20 feet under your house? Yeah. And when was your house built? 1820s. I'm going to do something with this. I'm not sure what. Something about New York, probably. It's 20 Buried feet treasures. Feet 20 feet Who knows? It'll find its way into something. Huh. I don't it's know. It's a mystery. Can you find out actually what it is? Yeah, I'll check. I'll do some checking. Okay. All right. You going? Yeah. Really? Really. Am I that lucky? <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of collectors that I've developed close relationships with. Larry Hagman started collecting my work.
recently he had a liver transplant and I was watching the news and the surgeon says the liver has been transplanted. It took longer than usual because we found a lot of gallstones, but Larry wants his friend Barton Benish, an artist in New York, to have the gallstones. This was on CNN. My phone. It was nuts here. So that's how I started collecting the celebrity things and they're good sources for relics. This is my palette. These are my paints. Uh, and I keep everything categorized by subject that I use in my collages. Uh, let's go into politics. This is a good one. Princess Alexandra and the Prince of Wales, piece of the wedding cake. And my friend Jeffrey Cher, used to be the editor of Art and Antiques, gave me three crumbs from their wedding cake. How about Nancy Reagan's napkin with chocolate souffle. A friend of mine was eating in a restaurant in Los Angeles and she was sitting at the next table. So when she left, before the waiter got there, he grabbed the napkin. Here's some Ringo Starr's makeup sponges. I, guess. I know a lot of people who do makeup, so I'm always getting stuff. Snips of hair, lipstick. This is a piece of Monica Lewinsky's straw that's been cut up many times. I've used it in many pieces. It was a long straw. <laughs> he's taking the chaos of the society we live in, and he's trying to put some order into it, both within the boxes and from one box to another. Yeah, let me see what's in death here. I like it because it's a taboo. You know, everything I like to work with is... Uh, Here's a piece of an Egyptian coffin, 200 BC. I'll take a subject like crime. So I'll get all kind of things about crime and build a whole case with crime. I think it took people a long time to take Barton's work seriously or to understand how serious it is and how multi-layered it is. They look like one-off jokes but the accumulation of them becomes a huge statement about contemporary life. Alan Dershowitz sent me the glove they used in the trial. Not the real, but the one that they put outdoors in the same situation to see what would happen with it. It's fascinating. Everybody has something that they don't know what to do with. Oh, this building is called West Beth. I moved here in 1970. I've lived in this apartment 34 years. I've gone more than half of my life. Um, and you have to be an artist to live here. Muriel Ruckheiser lived here. Diane Arbus lived down the hall. Merce Cunningham has the top floor here. It's a nice place to live, but now that this whole neighborhood is, all the yuppies have come in here and it's kind of creepy. This is like a safe fortress. Jim Cottrell is a collector of my work, and he was in Cuba, and he brought me back some cigar labels, and I used the cigar label itself as a frame. This took my museums into another space. Instead of doing all grids, I used this very elaborate little frames like old reliquariums. Barton doesn't fit into any movement. He really is a singular voice, and that means his voice will be heard for a long time. This is how I, I take a relic, like this one is war. So I take things from the drawer that have to do with war, and then I play them around and move them around, and, and I do the war frame, like camouflage. This is, I'm working on this right now. None of these are s glued down. So I, I'll take a relic, I mount it, I make these elaborate cards. I usually like to be funny, but I can't, be, this piece is, really isn't funny. I think he puts emotion pretty close to the surface of his work and is not afraid of it. And I think that's something that actually is hard to find.
It's also, I think it's, it's the intimacy of his work, very small objects which draw the viewer in. I had a show in North Dakota, and at the opening, this Air Force guy came after the show and said, I have something you might want. And he said, I have a piece of Saddam's palace. And he brought me a piece of Saddam's palace. That's pretty fabulous. <laughs> I go to North Dakota to get a piece of Saddam Hussein's palace. These are some relics that I haven't put in yet. This is a piece of a pilot's boot. You know, that'll probably go get worked into one of these things here. I may even put more frames. You never know, they keep growing. And as I get new relics, I'm always editing. So all these pieces I make are never finished because I may get a fantastic thing. After the glass is on, I take the glass off and I remove something. So things keep getting updated and changed. This is an ossuary place where you keep bones. This is a skull fragment from a victim of the Black Plague in the 14th century. And I stole that. <laughs> I really did. This is the contents of an owl's stomach. That's the director of the North Dakota Museum. It's her hip bone. And then this, I met a woman from Kentucky. And so she sent me a rattlesnake tail. And she said she shot it herself. <laughs> so I think that's, and, and I found this label that looks just, you know, the, the, the cow, the, perfect for it. I applied for a grant and I said I needed, I forgot how many thousands of dollars to tear up. And I says, I need all this money in singles. I got the grant. <laughs> I just used a little money on something and then the Federal Reserve saw it in a show and they wanted me to donate a piece to their collection. Well, I wound up getting from the Federal Reserve all total overall, $20 million shredded. These are old French francs, a nice color on them. And then I got bored with dollars. I wanted color. So then I got interested in foreign money. And then all of a sudden it wasn't about the, the taboo of it anymore. Money became like paint. This is a study for the souvenirs I did. I make a souvenir of the country out of their money. The English pound is made into a tea bag. The Saudi Arabia is made into a can of oil. Howard was my boyfriend. We were together for 30 years. And he was an artist. Uh, he made baskets, beautiful baskets out of horse hair. And then he also took the money that I got the shredded money from the Federal Reserve. And Howard would take those shreds and put them on the loom and actually weave the money back together again. And um, he put three bills back together from this big bale of money where he actually matched the numbers, and I have them here. I first saw Barton's work in 1982, and they were sort of wonderfully intriguing sculpture objects. Uh, but I have to say, it wasn't until Barton's responses to the AIDS crisis and his own health crisis that I became sort of profoundly moved by the work. And for me, it moved from clever art making with a clever idea to very personal art making, expressive of of his sorrow, his pain, and, and society's pain and sorrow. I never knew what to do about AIDS. It was a hard subject for me. I, and I was, I, you know, I was positive and my boyfriend had died and it was something I, I couldn't deal with. I, didn't, I couldn't make art about it and I didn't like what I had seen done. And then my friend Chris, his sister died and the family didn't want the ashes. 
you know, she, she was a drug addict and they, they didn't want her ashes. So I said, let me make something nice for her. I hated the AIDS ribbon, the, how it became a fashion statement. So I made 200 ribbons out of Brenda's ashes and I gave her some dignity. And then friends of mine saw what I did with Brenda's ashes, friends who had AIDS, and they asked me to do something with their ashes. I knew two guys who had AIDS, and there were a couple, Noel and James. So I had both of their ashes, and I thought they should be together, and I mixed them together and made an hourglass. And so I have them together for eternity in an hourglass, which gave me the idea. You know, my, this apartment is going to the museum in North Dakota, so my ashes are going into a pillow. The, the apartment embodies all of the quirks and the interests of someone who's very involved in the popular life. It should be preserved as an actual work of art. They're going to rebuild this apartment exactly the way it is and install it. So if I see a piece of African art that I want and I think, well, I don't know if I should buy it, I'm sick, I may not be around, I think, no, it's mine always. So I that's why I keep buying stuff. But I got hooked up with North Dakota because of the blood stuff. You know, that's some of the first um, AIDS work I did. And it started, I was in the kitchen cutting parsley one day and I cut a piece of my finger and blood went everywhere and I freaked out. So what I did is I ran for the bleach and rubber gloves. And I put on rubber gloves, afraid of my own blood, and cleaning it with bleach and freaking out. And I thought, then I realized, boy, this is, this is scary stuff, it's powerful. And that's, so I thought, I may start making weapons out of it. I filled a water pistol with my blood. I filled a perfume bottle. Uh, I made a Molotov cocktail. I did the show in North Dakota. I had no trouble at all. But then the show went to Sweden. And for some reason, somebody complained, said I'm spreading AIDS. So the health minister came and closed my show down. And I had come back to the States. And the gallery called me and said, we're in trouble, Barton. He says they closed my gallery. I was freaked out. I hadn't told my mother, anybody about my, and this thing was in the newspapers all over. I mean, it hit the, it hit the wires. And I thought, oh, shh, I'm in trouble. So they took the art to the hospital, the whole exhibition, and heated it at 160 degrees for two hours. And then each work had a certificate saying it was safe to sell. I never thought I would become a terrorist, <laughs> but that's what I became. That's what they called me. You wouldn't believe the tabloids in England. They called it the AIDS horror show. But it also was very educational because um, I think it helped people. It, it made people talk about it. These are the AIDS cocktail. And then some of the pills uh, take away the bad side effects that some of the pills give you. <laughs> there, 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 there. There. Right. And then this. I take about 24 pills a day, but I used to take a lot more. They fix it so you don't have to take as many pills used to have to do this four times a day. Now you only do it in the morning and at night. So it's a lot easier. I also make art with my pills. I don't only swallow them, I glue them. And I make, I make petty force. Like this is uh, D4T, 
Is it AZT? Let me pull a gunball machine. This is... This is a fun one. This gumball machine is filled with all different age drugs. And the whole machine is covered with dollar bills. And I put a nickel in and I get a different combination each time. So let's see what I get out now. There. See what a nickel will get you? But boy, this stuff costs a lot more than a nickel. <laughs> I think AIDS got me some notoriety. But um, I don't want to ever be called an AIDS artist because I'm not. And I hate that expression because everything I do is about what's happening in my life. Like my Aunt Evelyn was happening in my life. I did Aunt Evelyn. Africa, I was doing the shells. I mean, it gets rid of my fear. It's like death. You know, like when Howard was so sick and I was with him when he died and I went through the whole thing with him. It took my fear of dying away. So when you're living with stuff and, you know, and experiencing it, you get over whatever, the taboo goes away. Same with tearing up money, you know, like you give someone a dollar, say tear it up, they can't tear it up. They're terrified to tear it up. But once you can start tearing up money, you know, you're free. <laughs>